All right, this morning we're going we're gonna to actually look to close out our study of Matthew chapter 10. Um, and we pick up with verse 34. Jesus is still uh, giving some final instructions to his apostles prior to sending them out on what we know and refer to as the limited commission. Uh, you remember, uh, well, <laughs> it's been a couple weeks now, but in our last study, we, Jesus had reminded them of their great value in the eyes of God. And so he, he was telling them, you know, how you're to go forth, what you're to uh, take with you, which was nothing, and, and what you were to expect. And, and, uh, and as is the, the custom and manner of our Lord Jesus the Christ, he he was uh, giving this some encouragement. I know that this task is a, a big task. I know this commission is, uh, is going to be difficult and challenging from time to time. But understand how valuable you are in the eyes of God. And, and that God's going to take care of you. If you take care of his business, he's going to take care of your business. And, and that's what he said in verses 29 through 33. Here in verse 34, as he's giving his final instructions, he's, he's telling them about... Uh, uh, again, going back to the warfare that you're going to expect, but also the glorious reward, uh, and that's what we're going. That's what we're looking at. In fact, uh, we we looked a little bit at verse 34 in our study uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, verse 34 again reads, uh, "Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword." And uh, so. Uh, you remember uh, Isaiah the prophet uh, said what concerning the Christ in Isaiah 9 and in verse 6. Uh, he, he gave him a lot of different uh, descriptions, right? And, and one of those descriptions was a prince of what? He was and is the prince of peace. And yet he himself says that he did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And so... How do you, do you remember how uh, we harmonized uh, uh, Matthew 10, 34 with Isaiah 9, 6? And I know that uh, that's a lot of time and a lot of things have happened. And so uh, you remember that uh, the way I uh, addressed the subject was that Jesus himself, the person the man is the source of peace. Someone read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Thank you, brother. And, and so in that sense, he himself, the man, is the Prince of Peace. Uh, notice the, the, the text itself, that uh, in Christ Jesus, uh, he himself, uh, and it says in his flesh, create in himself, uh, and, and, and thus what? In him making peace, in what way? Reconciling them, uh, Jew and Gentile, in one body uh, through the cross. And so, uh, and that's certainly... Uh, what we would say in regard to uh, him still being the Prince of Peace, that he himself is. And what is it that, you remember what we asked, what we said, uh, how is it that Jesus himself, uh, and, and of course, we kind of get an idea from Ephesians chapter 2, how did he become the Prince of Peace? What did he do? For us, that no one else could do. Yeah, he, he, he died for us on the cross. And I, I, I would say, okay, um, uh, you know, what is uh, John 15, 13, uh, uh, laid down his, his life for his friends. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he died for us on the cross, but 
you think about what Jesus did and how he's the Prince of Peace. Uh, what does Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 say about us and our relationship with God? You Do what? Isaiah 15, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. What separated us from God? Our sin. Sin separated us from God. All of us committed sin, right? All of accountable age committed sin. Romans 3, 10. No one's righteous, no, not one. 3, 23. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. So, man in sin is separated from God. Jesus left heaven, his home, put on flesh, was like his brethren, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, was tempted in all points like as we, Hebrews 4 and in verse 15, did all things to please the Father, as John 8, 29 says, and ultimately gave his life on the cross that uh, we might have our sins forgiven. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1 and in verse 7. And so Jesus died uh, for our sins, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 3. Uh, he did what no other could do. And that is how he made peace. But now how he is the prince of peace, but how does sinful man obtain that peace, a peace that... Paul would describe that surpasses all understanding. What is it that man must do to obtain this peace? Obey the Lord. And, and this is exactly what, going back to what Ephesians 2, in Christ Jesus. How do we get in Christ Jesus? Baptism, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Galatians 3, verse 27. The only two passages in all of the New Testament tell, telling a person how to get into Christ. And that is in baptism. So uh, when we're baptized into Christ, now we're baptized into the Prince of Peace. And as a result, we have a peace that passes all understanding. Philippians 4, there in verse 7. Uh, and uh, uh, now, again, what we talked about, uh, how, uh, pay close attention to what the text says. He said, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Uh, again, we, we had the privilege of some uh, speakers during the lectureship that really showed us the value of word study. And, and I love word studies. And if you look at the word bring in the original language, it means to cast or to send. So it's something that Jesus brought with him. What did Jesus bring with him? He brought the Word of God, didn't he? He brought God's Word. Uh, and uh, what does Ephesians 6, 17 tell us about God's Word? It, uh, Hebrews 4, 12, uh, two-edged sword, but you, 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 hit the, you hit the Word that I'm looking for. Uh, the Word of God is what? The sword of the Spirit. That's Ephesians 6 and in verse 17. So Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace, but a what? Sword. What's the word of God? Sword. What, do you, what is a sword? It's a weapon, right? And what do you do with a weapon? Okay. And that's good. Because uh, you, you really use a weapon for two reasons, right? You use it uh, in, in an offensive way and also in a defensive way. And uh, how do we use the Word of God offensively? Well, that's kind of more along, uh, well, yes, and, and also it's kind of more the, the defensively too. But how do we do it just solely offensively? Spreading the gospel. Teach evangelistic, right? We're reaching out with the Word of God. And, but you also use it defensively, uh, defending the truth against false doctrine uh, and uh, uh, not giving false teachers even a, an, an opportunity. Um, and isn't that what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says? 
right? Paul told the young preacher Timothy, he said, all scripture is given of inspiration of God and is profitable. It's beneficial for what? Doctrine, which is what? Teaching. There's your offensive. It's, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. What's reproof? It, it's, 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 it's more, in, you know, and I always think, I get kind of confused from time to time on reproof. What is reproof? But it's more like you're to blame. You're, you're identifying the false teacher. You're the false teacher. I'm not going to, not going to, uh, you know, sugarcoat it. Good, good, appreciate that. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You're the, you're the false teacher. You're identified as the one to blame. Uh, what is, uh, is it Romans 16, 17, where, where Paul tells us to uh, note those who uh, cause defenses, mark them, avoid them. And so that's reproof. You're to blame for this, this error. Do what? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, uh, and, and so it's probably for doctrine, for reproof, for what? Correction. There's your, uh, your reproof and correction. There's your more of your defense, right? Uh, you're in error here. You're to blame. You're in error. Why? Because you're teaching this and the scriptures say this. I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm not going to give you a suggestion. I'm going to show you scripture. Here is what you're saying in violation of scripture. This is what makes you a false teacher. This is what makes you to blame. That's reproof. Correction. And then what? Instruction in righteousness. There again is using it offensively for teaching. And so you look at a couple of measures there. There's four ways that the word of God is used. Two offensively, two defensively. And that's how you use a weapon. Now, but what does a weapon also suggest? Cutting away of sin, yes. Discipline. Uh, disciplines are good with, with Peter in the garden. He had the sword and cut off Malchus's ear, servant of the high priest. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and what did Jesus tell him there? Put your sword in its place. Discipline. Uh, discipline would be uh, in teaching, Ephesians 4, verse 15, speaking the truth in what? In love. Uh, you know, and so, uh, but when you have a weapon, it's suggesting that there's a battle, right? That there's a war. What does Galatians 5, 16, and 17 tell us? Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Okay, so there's a, there's a battle going on. The battle between the flesh and the spirit. And that's not, uh, you know, that's uh, the, the spiritual realm, the physical realm. That's also... A personal battle, right? But it's also a battle that we're facing outwardly. This is a battle that's uh, confronting us. Uh, false teaching, that's a, that's a spiritual battle there. And uh, uh, so, weapon, when you look at the sword, he, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. And his message, right, is what we're talking about. And his message is not always received favorably is it you know and isn't that what he said in verses 21 and 22 brother will deliver brother to death the father his child children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death you will be hated by all for my name's sake but uh, he who endures the end will be saved and so the, Jesus is being flat out honest with him he said you're going to go out and you're going to take the message what is the message verse 6 I think uh, verse 7, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what you're going to be preaching. That's what you're going to be teaching. It's not going to be received well by everyone. Uh, and, and he's already kind of covered that uh, pretty well. But, but we know that uh, when you look at the message of, of God as it's presented, uh, even in the first century, say even in the 21st century today, that some people believe it and obey it. Some people believe it and won't obey it. Who would be an example of that? 
Well, the devil definitely believes and trembles, uh, but that would be more in the spiritual realm. But keeping it in the terrestrial plane, uh, who would be individuals who would believe him but not obey him? Festus. Uh, yeah, there'd be, you would talk about kings and uh, Agrippa. Almost you persuaded me to become a Christian. Uh, as with Felix had said, uh, go away, and when I have a convenient time, I'll send for you again. Uh, but the... Um, Huh? Okay, yeah, that would that would definitely fit there. Any unfaithful Christian would fit in that category. Do what? Jews uh, and and they're in specifically they're rulers of the synagogue. You remember John chapter twelve verse forty two? Many of the rulers believed in him, but for fear of being what put out of the synagogue, they didn't obey him. So. There's example of those who believed and obeyed, those who believed and wouldn't obey. And then there's the example of those who rejected it altogether. And that would be the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes and all the other E's because uh, uh, he, he, was a, he represented a threat to their position, a threat to their, their power, their authority. And so they rejected him. In fact, uh, uh, maybe John chapter 7 uh, where, where they would say, you know, how is it that you have come to believe this Jesus of Nazareth? We don't even believe him. As if they're the standard of what you should and should not accept as being true. Uh, and so, yeah, we have the word of God is still received in the same way. Um, now, as, as we already discussed, verses 21 and 22, Jesus is going to elaborate that uh, upon that. In, in, in even this statement here in the next couple of verses. But we know that this, you know, it's not like we're in the first century sandals, right? What they experienced then is somewhat different than what we experience now, right? Um, how many of us are persecuted in the sense of uh, threatened to be hung on a cross, you know, how many of us are being scourged and, and things of the, what they were willing to endure and, and had to endure in that day is different than what we endure today. But we know that even walking on earth in our Christian journey is not always easy, is it? It's not always easy. Uh, it's not always easy to remain faithfully obedient to his message. It's not always easy uh, because you go through various trials uh, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It's not always easy because we go through various heartaches and troubles, divisions and strives. Uh, and, and we understand the struggle to remain true. But Jesus' message ha continues to cause division today as it did then. Uh, there's another passage. Uh, turn with me to... 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at, uh, look at beginning there in verse 1, and, and I'll read through verse uh, uh, 17. Uh, not verse 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I, I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say I had baptized you in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Christ did not send me to the baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the, cro the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And again, he, he continues to address that same subject there in the, in the remaining portions of that, that text through verse 21. But uh, it always caused division. It always will cause division. When you think of I am of Apollos, I am of Paul, I am of Christ, you know, don't we have the same issue today where individuals get attached to a messenger and they look at the messenger more than the message? 
Um, I think we'll see a, a little bit more of that in our studies today, uh, at, at least a possibility. But I like how Kaufman put it, and Kaufman is a uh, commentary, and of course it's an uninspired source, and you need to understand it that way, but uh, he says uh, that a sword should be identified with Christ in any sense is a warning of the severity which is one characteristic of his glorious nature. Romans, 1, Romans 11, 22 says, Behold the goodness and severity of God. One who obeys Christ uh, uh, despite uh, children or parental opposition feels the edge of that sword. A young woman who maintains her ideals and purity in an office where low standards prevail soon feels that sword in her heart. All who live for Christ and bleed inwardly when his name is profaned or his word denied have felt it. A similar thought is contained in the voice from heaven that commanded John to eat the little book. Revelation 10 verse 9. Take it, eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but in thy mouth it shall be sweet as honey. We all, as, as great and as uh, sweet as the word of God is, Still, our faithfulness to it takes us in a path that is filled oftentimes with sorrows and heartaches and challenges and difficulties. But as you go to James chapter 1 and in verse 12, I know he's talking about temptation. But when you have endured these things faithfully, you know, you're going to be made better as a result of going through those experiences. And... Um, any any thoughts or comments there? Verse verse thirty four. Yes. Yeah. People speak against God, against us. They can hit us from a spot that may never. So the tongue is just even more powerful. And you're, you're, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and of course, they experienced that same threat of the tongue, too. But James chapter 3 speaks great length there about the tongue and how dangerous, how, how big a weapon it is. Um, but even it can be used what? Offensively, defensively, you know, and uh, look at 30, the verses 35 and 36. He says, For I have uh, come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter in law against her mother in law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Again, he's elaborating on verses 21 and 22 we read just moments ago, but you know, how many times have we seen the effect of, of God's message upon a family? Uh, you know, and I think the longer you've been a Christian and the more you've experienced, the more you have, uh, you've witnessed uh, that turmoil that happens within a family. Uh, how many have been uh, raised as a devout uh, Catholic and then one is converted to Christ and the turmoil that happens within that family. And it doesn't have to be Catholicism. I just, it, it could be any, any other, uh, uh, denomination or, or religious institution, but we know the difficulty that uh, develops within a family when one is brought to Christ and others reject him. Uh, and um, when, a, when a house is divided, what, it, what, is, what did Jesus say? A uh, house divided against itself, what? It can't stand, it's going to fall. Uh, Luke chapter 11 and verse 17. And so Again, that's kind of the picture that we're seeing. Verse 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And, and this is in connection there, right? Uh, it's because of this division within the family that many people refuse to come to the Lord. I, I know many. I've got some in my family that refuse to obey uh, the Lord. Why? Because of what that might mean to their grandparents, or what that might mean to their parents, uh, you know, and, and, and so a, 
allegiance to parents, allegiance to family, it prevents a lot of individuals from obeying the gospel. Uh, and that's what Jesus is addressing right here. Uh, and he's telling his apostles that, you know, you're going to see this. And, 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 and isn't that one of the reasons why Jesus tells everyone before you obey the gospel that you what? You count the cost. Uh, because it could cause friction within the family. It could cause friction within the, the closest of earthly bonds. Are you going to, are you, is your conviction strong enough to carry you through or are you going to compromise and fall away? Because nothing is more detrimental to the cause of Christ than for somebody who was once solid and, and faithful falling away. Uh, that's detrimental to the cause of Christ. And so he wants us to count. And he speaks at great length on that there in Luke uh, chapter uh, 14, um, uh, verses 25 and following. Uh, counting the cost. And, and in fact, it was in Matthew chapter 8, 21 and 22 that we talked about earlier where Jesus had put out that invitation to follow him and, and somebody said, well, hey, I'll follow you, but let me first tend to my father. That's an individual who is, is putting an allegiance to the parent more than allegiance to the Christ. And he, he was rebuked for that. Uh, uh, so um, we, we see that... that God must come first uh, uh, over, over family. And as Jesus continued to give his apostles instruction, he acknowledges that, that this is a hard saying. And it's going to be difficult when you're going into a house and somebody responds in obedience and somebody doesn't. You see this turmoil developing and, and, you, and, and you know your heart's desire as a human being to be passionate and, and uh, loving. You don't want to see that. And uh, but Jesus is saying you can't quit. I, I'm telling you this because this is what you're going to expect. And uh, but your responsibility to carry out the commission is going to remain no matter what, how hard these things are to see and to witness. Uh, you, you're going to have to continue to uh, fulfill the commission. And his point to us is simply this, that we are to love God. We are to love his commandments. Uh, to, to, to a level that we're not going to allow even a beloved family member to sway us away into disobedience. You know, and I started to think about the, the idea of how many times have we seen someone's conviction, their, their belief, this behavior is sinful. And then what happens when one of their family members is caught up in that sin? What oftentimes happens? You start to make excuses. Those convictions start to get compromised. You start to explain away. You try to explain away uh, and to excuse. We see that all the time. Uh, and that's that human inclination, that, that human bond. Uh, you don't want to see somebody that you love lost, and you try to change the scriptures to fit the situation and if God has made one thing clear is you've got to change the situation to fit the scripture right the scripture is not going to change uh, sin is going to be sin regardless of who's caught up in it or not uh, and we're not doing anybody any favor trying to excuse it are we because if we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, we're going to want, we're going to look beyond the physical, we're going to look to the spiritual, we're going to look beyond the temporal, and we're going to look to the eternal. Uh, we should care more about somebody's soul than we do about their, their physical being. Um, but he continues this thought in the next couple of verses. Verse 38, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. What does it mean to take his cross? Do what? Fighting the devil. You, you're gonna. It's not gonna be a bed of roses. It, I mean, even if it is a bed of roses, it's gonna be filled with what? Thorns. You know. So uh, carrying the burden. As, as Jesus is the example of that, right? 
uh, and uh, it's not going to be comfortable. It's it's uh, uh, it's going to require sacrifice. This definitely doesn't mean wearing a lapel pin or putting a sticker on your car. It means to confess Christ, no matter what, to be loyal to Christ, no matter what. Um, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12 says, Yea, and all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Suffer persecution. Persecution is, was a sentence in, in, in their Christian journey. It is a sentence in their Christian journey. We've got to expect it. And if we are truly living as Christians ought to live, there, needs to, there will be some type of persecution along the way. Verbal persecution, uh, Maybe even physical persecution, depending on where you're at in this world. But this is all going back to what Jesus said. I didn't, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Um, to follow after Jesus simply means to follow in his steps. And he left his steps to follow 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. Uh, verse 39, he who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Uh, here, the, the word life is uh, used in reference to your physical life. But the word it is in reference to eternal life. And that term find it simply means to secure, to obtain eternal life. And so his point is there's, there's constant danger of putting too much emphasis on uh, uh, in this temporary realm. And isn't that true? 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Didn't he say, uh, uh, someone get me started. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And, uh, and so the, the idea is we, we've got to put away those, those things, those, those devotions, those passions, those uh, desires and, and, and do the will of God uh, in order to abide uh, forever. And again, that's 1 John 2, 15 through, through 17. Uh, and Mark 8, 36 and 37. Uh, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, that's, it, it speaks volumes to us. Don't, don't put so much emphasis on this temporary realm. Don't, don't, make, this, don't make your earthly existence all about uh, uh, peace and comfort on earth. Because it simply cannot compare to peace and comfort in heaven. You can't compare a hundred years to eternity. It's not even a drop in the bucket. Um, Second Corinthians chapter four. Uh, verse beginning in verse sixteen. Therefore. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction was but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. I love verse 18. Do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's where our eyes need to be, is on the that which is eternal. Um, and so, really, in an effort to strongly emphasize verses 28, 32, and 33, Christ is saying, you know, if you deny me in the presence of your persecutors, you, you, may, you may enjoy a, a nice life here on earth, but you're going to lose your soul. But if you continue to confess me in the face of your persecutors, your opposition, your resistance, no matter what, if you continue to confess me, then uh, your life on earth may not be... Uh, easy, and it may not be peaceful, and it may not be joyful, but the reward is far greater. What does Romans 8 verse 18 say? Uh, I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Um, 
So verses 34 through 38, you remember we're talking about principles of evangelism? You can't ring the bell. Personal uh, evangelism uh, in, in number eight is put the Lord first, right? The Lord has to come first no matter what. You put him before family. You put him before self. Put him before anything and everything. And, uh, yeah, we have a responsibility to our family. Yeah, First Timothy 5 and in verse 8. But uh, we must not let them get in the way of serving Jesus and, and being the example that we need to be uh, to them. Uh, verses 40 through 42, we have the reward of those who welcome the king's messengers. Um, verses 40 and 41, he who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Jesus makes a very smooth transition here, the master teacher, from speaking about the persecutions to now uh, talking about the, the kind of treatment that they're going to receive. Yeah, you may be persecuted and you may have all this opposition, but you're also going to have the flip side of that. You're going to have a uh, kind treatment uh, from, from others in and uh, that truly is a blessing. And the principle taught there is that, that receiving the apostles, the apostles going out on a limited commission, if you receive the apostle, it's equivalent to you having received the Christ and, and the Father. And uh, it's important to note you can't receive Christ and the Father without accepting the message, right? Uh, the gospel of Christ. And, and I think... John summed that up pretty well, that in order to have the Father and the Son, you have to abide in the doctrine of Christ. Um, and uh, so inasmuch as their message, Jesus sends them out, inasmuch as their message is one and the same, uh, then if you receive one, it's the same as to receive all. Uh, and anyway, I think we can understand that. Verse 42 and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So when it comes to receiving a, a just reward, uh, it needs to be, it needs to be uh, made known that no act of service, no matter how small in the sight of man, uh, no act of service is small in the eyes of God. Just a cup of cold water is, you know, we think it's nothing. That's no big deal. Uh, but in the eyes of God, uh, it, it matters. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, you know, what is Ephesians, not Ephesians, Hebrews 4.13, all things uh, are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. He sees all things. He's everywhere. He sees all things. So he sees that those good works. He sees those those. Uh, good ser the good service that we render. Uh, he, he sees uh, people like uh, Lydia in Acts 16, verse 15, but he also sees people like Diotrephes that we read about in 3 John, verses 9 through, through 11. Uh, and perhaps a, a good summation of these verses is expressed in Matthew 25. Jesus said this in Matthew 25 and verse 40. He said, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to what? This is the same principle that he's teaching here. But the flip side is that in as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did not do it to what? To me. So um, it's not that I love this. It, it's not the messenger that matters, is it? Because he's, he's saying, it, you know, it could be the Lord himself. It could be the apostle. It could be a prophet. It could be a righteous man. It's not about the messenger. It's all about the message. It's all about the message and how one responds to it. But in these words, we have the ninth and final principle of evangelism. I still got a full two minutes. Uh, and that is supporters share in the reward, right? Supporters share in the reward. And, and that certainly uh, encourages those who receive the apostles. Uh, it illustrates the principle established by David when he and his men were pursuing the Amalekites. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, some had to be left with the supplies while others went out to fight the enemy. And David decreed that all should share alike, both those at the home front as well as those on the front line. And uh, 
those who support the apostles and all of God's messengers have fellowship both in the work and in the reward uh, of those they support. And, and so never underestimate the role of supporting. You think it's not a big deal. We're not doing much. If you're supporting a good, solid work, that's good in the eyes of God. Now, is that all that we should be doing? No, if that's not all that we're capable of doing, no. But each of us have our limits. Each of us have our uh, abilities. And, 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 but that's, the, that's something that everybody can do, right? And if I can't help and support in a monetary way, I can do what? I can pray. I can be hospitable. I can support in other ways. And uh, so... Uh, supporting those who are in the work is is, uh, is is a great work and not to ever be underestimated. And uh, let me just uh, quickly uh, remind you, uh, as we close out Matthew chapter ten, this account of the limited commission. Uh, I, I will say this: uh, it's worth noting that Matthew, as he's closing his account of the of the limited commission, he says nothing about the labors of the of the of the apostles, but Mark does. Mark talks about it in Mark chapter uh, 6, verses 12 and 13. Uh, but uh, we, we talked about uh, nine or, or eight principles of evangelism, uh, or, or nine. And that is the, the principle of synergy, working together as a team can accomplish a lot more. Principle of evangelism, making sure we proclaim the word of God. Uh, principle of... Uh, uh, Number three, principle of evangelism is practice what we preach. Number four is to support those who evangelize, really going right back with number nine. Uh, fifth is the need at times to be selective. There comes a time when we have to move on to a different project, different prospect. Uh, number six, to anticipate persecution and we'll be better prepared to, uh, to respond in a biblical way uh, when we are faced with resistance and opposition if we're expecting it and preparing for it. Number, uh, 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 was it number seven, uh, fearing God, not man. And then number eight, always putting the Lord first. Of course, number nine was the same as we talked about earlier, uh, supporting those who, uh, who, who uh, go to the front line, so to speak. But when you look at these principles of evangelism that we see there, uh, Certainly, I think if, if we put those into practice today, we can see the same effects that we saw in the first century, where the church of our Lord blossomed, bloomed, and we can do the same if we, we do the same. Uh, thank you for extending my time, but uh, God willing, we'll pick up with Matthew chapter 11 next week.